Biblos, Homeland, Local Religion, and Temple Cults. Can you answer these questions from our last discussion? How did pagan worship work? What were its many forms? What is the ancient meaning of the words myth, mystery, ecstasy, and mysticism? How did local pagan gods transform into gods of everything? Part 1. The Temple of the God Wrestlers Tribes Last time, we discussed how paganism, on the whole, was quite local. The people we call pagans were concerned overwhelmingly with the gods and temples of their immediate environments. The gods of my city. The demigods that I am related to. The gods who watch over my house. The god of this town's yearly festivals. But, from time to time, the jurisdiction of a certain god would expand beyond the local. Sometimes gods were particularly popular in lots of places, for whatever reason. Or someone traveled far away and would bring back a particularly productive god with them. And sometimes, an imperial god would be spread wherever that certain empire went. The most famous god of pagan antiquity, the god of the Jerusalem temple, would be a little bit like all of these. First, he was just one more local god amongst many others. Then, he would be the god of a small empire's dynasty. And then, he would be a god whose mythology expanded within a later, much larger empire. But first, we have to go back to a king named David, who lived around the year 1000 BCE. He had become the first ruler of a tribal alliance involving 12 interrelated tribes. It was something of a little empire, a lot of different tribes of people who were brought together under David's rule. The 12 tribes claimed common descent from a man named Jacob, who had lived centuries earlier. This Jacob once entered into hand-to-hand combat with one of the gods of the ancient Near East, and so Jacob was given the nickname, the God Wrestler, the one who wrestles with God, Yisrael. Then, centuries later, many of the tribes who claimed descent from this ancient hero called themselves the tribes or sons of Yisrael, or Israel, Israelites. Now David, a king from one of these tribes, attempted to unite them all under a single monarchy. And empires, even small tribal ones, like to unite people under single gods. David's son, Solomon, worked to further consolidate his father's tribal union by patronizing the tribe's common ancestral god. Now, at the time, there were many gods being worshipped in Solomon's kingdom. There were gods like Baal, the title for a number of interrelated sky and thunder gods, roughly equated with Zeus, and fertility goddesses like Asherah, just one more of the many fertility goddesses of the ancient pagan world. Solomon instead promoted just the cult of one god, a god that was common to all the twelve tribes of Israel. And in this god's honor, Solomon built a national temple in the capital his father David founded a generation earlier, on a centrally located hill called Zion. There, on Mount Zion, there was already an ancient city called Jerusalem. And Solomon's new Jerusalem temple often just called the Temple of Solomon, would function there for the next four centuries until it was destroyed in 587 BCE. We'll return to that in a minute. Now, this temple and its god 
would play a major role in world history for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. But we have to remember that people at the time didn't know that. Right? They couldn't see those religions coming. Just one more god and one more temple amongst many others in the Mediterranean basin. This temple wouldn't have struck outsiders as being particularly distinct in any notable way. The temple functioned more or less like other ancient temples in the pagan world. There was an outer layer, which was a marketplace where people came and went freely. Then within that was a public religious space where people would make burnt offerings and speak with temple priests. And inside that was an inner sanctum, the Kodesh HaKadashim, the holiest of holy places, or as we usually say in translation, the holy of holies. There, relics of this god were kept, and so even priests rarely went in there. In fact, only one priest would go in one day a year. Once a year, the high priest of Solomon's temple would purify himself and then enter this holy of holies to ask the god there to forgive the people for whatever they may have done wrong, and ask blessings for the year to come. This was called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. At once, this suggests a day of asking forgiveness, but also, like the English word atonement suggests, it was the day when the God and its people came together. At one mint. Get it? Who were these people, these twelve tribes? These people were first called what all ancient people call themselves, their ethnic name, Hebrews. Now, once again, there was no notion of religion, so neither was there a distinctive name for this religion. Hebrew, like Greek or Egyptian, explained culture, language, ancestry, dress, food, and religion, all in one word. Our words, like Jews and Judaism, didn't exist until way, way, way later. So let's leave them to the side for now. We're just going to start with the words Hebrews, the ethnic name, or the tribes of Israel, the ancestral common name. Their common language was Hebrew, right? They're called the Hebrews, and so they speak the Hebrew language. Now, Hebrew is not Indo-European, like English, Latin, Greek, or Sanskrit. It's not related to English at all. Hebrew was part of the Semitic language family. The Semitic language family includes languages like Akkadian, one of the languages of Mesopotamia, Gaiz, the language of pre-modern Ethiopia, Aramaic, the language of many of the early Christians many centuries later, and many centuries after that, Arabic, the language of the tribes down in Arabia which would become the language of early Islam. The Semitic languages all shared a root system, which consisted of three consonants. Usually in Semitic languages, you don't write the vowels. Not usually, anyway. Words were formed by manipulating this root system. Right? You would change the pronunciation of these three-letter roots. So, for instance, consider the Semitic root S-L-M. In all Semitic languages, the root S-L-M has something to do with peace. So in Hebrew, you would vocalize S-L-M as Shalom, peace. Or the name Solomon, he is at peace. And you can see comparable words in other Semitic languages. In Aramaic, you can see the name Salome, she is at peace and many popular Arabic words like salam, peace, Islam, submission, or being at peace with something, and Muslim, one who is pacified, one who is at peace. The pronunciations are all different, but the root remains the same, S-L-M, in that order. And this was the source of nearly all words, whether they were verbs, nouns, adjectives, or personal names. Like other ancient people, the Hebrews called their god by lots of different names and titles. One of these was based on the root a, la, ha. Right? So basically, a glottal stop, a, 
the letter L, and the letter H. So in Hebrew, this is the standard word for God, Elohim. And later Jesus, who spoke Aramaic, a related language, called God Allaha. And even later than that, Muhammad, who spoke Arabic, called God Allah. All of these simply mean the God. But, also like the pagan gods, the Hebrew god Elohim had a proper name. In Hebrew, it's spelled like this. Now, remember that in most Semitic languages, at most times, you didn't use vowels when you wrote. But, you would know from context how to pronounce everything when you saw it. Now, we're not entirely sure when this happened, but at some point, the Hebrews started to consider their god's proper name taboo. You didn't say it out loud. And many Jews today, but not all, still don't say it out loud. So, in the name of good manners, we're not going to say it out loud here either. But when a Hebrew reader saw this God's proper name written out, they would know where the vowels went. They would know how to say it, even if they didn't actually say it. So, to avoid saying the word, when you had to read a text out loud, you would instead say, My Lord, Adonai, or just the Lord. So every time you see a translation of something from Hebrew that says the Lord, it actually says YHWH in the original text. In modern texts and speech, many Jews will work around this name in other ways too. So sometimes even saying Adonai, my Lord, is too close to God's actual name. So they'll instead say Hashem, the name, meaning the God whose name we don't say. And amongst more conservative writers, in writing, you'll see dashes inserted to get around even suggesting this god. So you'll see G-D or L-R-D. Now, Christians, centuries later, long after these Hebrew texts appeared, would translate them into Latin. And they would also write out God's name, but they would use Latin spellings, where there's vowels. Well, in Latin, the Hebrew Y turns into the Latin J. Long story, don't ask. And the letter W would turn into a V. So they Latinized this God's name as Jehovah, and often used the shortened term, Jah. Part 2. The Religion of Exiles. The Hebrews had their temple, and it functioned as ancient temples did for centuries. The temple was where your god lived, where you participated in your myths, and it was the cultural, social, and economic center of your world, like all ancient temples and ancient cities were. It was the center of your personal universe. This is where your god was present, most especially. It's where you went for your most important festivals, and it was where your rulers got their power and it was also where you did your shopping. So it was the hub of your culture, your history, your economics, your government, and your cosmos, all in one place. But then disaster struck. The Babylonians, under King Nebuchadnezzar II, invaded and, during the sack of the city of Jerusalem, burnt most of the city to the ground, including Solomon's temple. And as many pre-modern conquerors often did, you could destabilize and subjugate a rival people by taking their ruling classes hostage. Right? Farmers and peasants would be left behind to take care of the land, watch by their normal affairs, keep things going. But the wealthy, the priests, and anyone else who had any kind of authority could just be carted off with their families. So Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple most of Jerusalem, and brought the surviving upper classes of Hebrew society back to Babylon as captives. This forced sojourn of many of the Hebrews would later be referred to as the Babylonian captivity. Now, besides just being taken captive, we have here a problem. Remember what we learned about how the pagan world worked. The gods were close to their people. Gods lived in particular places, and not others, and their temples most especially. 
and gods ruled over certain lands and not others, and they were tended to by a certain priesthood. The temple cult needed maintenance. Sanctums needed to be kept safe. Sacrifices had to be made, and festivals had to be observed. In the case of the Hebrews, the principal one was Yom Kippur, when the priest would enter the Holy of Holies to reconcile the people with their God. But now, in a single moment, all this is wiped away. The temple is gone. The cult is gone. The sanctum has been violated and now it no longer exists. The priests are all either dead or being held captive some 700 miles away. The link with God has been broken. So, to put it in the language of modern psychotherapy, many of the people suffered what we would now call a breakdown, a mental rupture. Everything important in their lives was shattered violently and all at once. So, what did the Hebrews do? Without the mysteries of their temple cult, all they had left were the myths. And remember, here we mean myths in the non-disparaging sense. Right? Myths are stories that expose your ultimate reality. The stories that exposed their God. The temple was gone, but what was in their heads survived. Their stories, their myths, they began to take on a very distinct function. Now, myths were important to all ancient peoples in the pagan world, but now for the Hebrews, their value was even higher. For most people, the myths were lived out in the life of a local temple, but for the Hebrews in captivity, the myths were all they had. And so, the literatures of the Hebrews, their written myths, came to take on a role that the temple itself once fulfilled. In the stories, you found your god, because your stories were all you had to work with. Now, some of the Hebrew stories were already written down before the Babylonian captivity. These would be collected and edited. And some already ancient oral myths would have to get written down for the first time. And a whole lot of new material would also be produced and written down in the wake of the temple's destruction. And nearly all of these Hebrew literatures would be framed around the themes that were relevant to the day. The themes of exile, of the temple, homeland, and the permanence of people's relationship to their god. The oldest literatures that these Hebrew peoples gathered together were called Torah, instruction. These would come to take on the form of five books, each of which told the story of how the Hebrew tribes came to be, how they were supposed to live, and how, as a people, they could find their god even when they didn't seem to be in that God's jurisdiction. Now, while the Torah was very clear that the temple and its territory was very important, what was more important than that was that Elohim had a relationship to the Hebrews themselves. He had chosen them, and so they were his chosen people. Together they had a covenant, a contract, Elohim and the Hebrews had struck a deal, and that deal was binding forever, everywhere. Without a temple, the covenant remains in effect. Even if people didn't follow their ancestral religious practices, the covenant survived, even in a foreign land. Now, the entirety of the Torah would have to reflect this. The Hebrew God was now not just a God of one local place, he would have to become a god of everything. So he made the entire world a god of all things. And over the course of six days, he created everything everywhere, finally resting from his work on the seventh day. And so, in participation with the myth, the Hebrews too would rest every seventh day from their labor. They would take a Shabbat, or Sabbath, a rest. This would bring them back into harmony with the story of Elohim. And this God had struck a deal with their ancestors, with Adam and Eve. And when that deal was violated, they, like their Hebrew descendants, would be forced to live in exile 
from their original homeland. Another of their ancestors, Abraham, was living in Mesopotamia, read Babylon, and Elohim set Abraham out into a foreign land that he had never been to before. And there God made a covenant with Abraham too. Elohim would be Abraham's God, and Abraham would mark this deal with the rite of male circumcision. This is a mark that you can take with you wherever you go. And so later, the Hebrews in captivity would also practice circumcision in participation with their myth. It is a painful, dramatic reminder that your people had once struck a bargain with their God, and that bargain was not local to anywhere. And the Hebrews' ancestors had been in such foreign captivity before. There was mythic precedent for this. Once upon a time, they had been enslaved in the land of Egypt. But their God still heard their cries and remembered them, even far from home. And so Elohim sent a prophet named Moses to lead the Hebrews back to their homeland. And how did that enslavement end? Well, God, through his mouthpiece Moses killed all the firstborn sons of Egypt in a terrible plague, which the Hebrews escaped by celebrating a special meal, the Pesach, the passing over, the Passover. This was the passing over of their God's messenger of death. The Pesach is described in detail in the Torah. It was to be a meal on the go. The bread was to be baked in the fastest way possible, without using yeast, so you don't have to wait for the bread to rise. This is the food of the people who wanted to get out of here. This is the food of people who were on the move. And so the Hebrews in Babylon reenacted this Pesach in a yearly meal, because they wanted to get going too. And as the ancient Hebrews had wandered in the wilderness outside of Egypt, trying to return to their ancestral homeland, Elohim traveled with them. And so it makes sense that now, wandering around in another foreign land, Elohim is still traveling with the Hebrews. And it wasn't just about circumcision and to-go meals. The Torah, traditionally attributed to this prophet Moses himself as a direct dictation from God, contained all of the many cultural practices of the Hebrews, how they were to eat, and dress themselves, and marry, and operate their temple. All the things that they should do, and all the things that they shouldn't do. Each one a mitzvah, a commandment of their God. Later, these would become to be considered a collection of 613 mitzvahs, a collective marker of what it means to be a Hebrew. Here's what you have to do and not do. Now, many of these mitzvahs could only be practiced in the Jerusalem temple, but even if that temple no longer existed, the Torah could remind the Hebrews of how they were supposed to be serving their God. He told them exactly how to live. And so, even without a temple, their very lives would reenact the cult of Elohim. Part 3. Tanakh the story of Moses also told the Hebrews something else that was useful to know in their captivity of Babylon. Even without an active temple, and therefore no priests, you could still commune with your God through prophets. In Hebrew, the word is Naviim. And so the Hebrews collected, edited, and created literatures which explained their history and detailed the preachings of their prophets, the Nevi'im. This included past prophets like Moses, but it also included living prophets in Babylon. The Nevi'im, the prophets, explained how their ancestors came to live in their land originally, how they struggled with rival peoples and with rival gods, most especially Baal and Asherah. There were many of these prophets, both before, during, and after the Babylonian captivity. Some of them were kings and temple priests, but others were not. 
Some of them merely warned the Hebrews about their god and coming disaster, but others made deliberately strange public spectacles to expose the mysteries of their god. And all of them urge people to ignore rival cults. Here's just one of these prophets, a guy named Ezekiel. He was a temple priest in Jerusalem, and he lived through the destruction of the temple. Later, when he was 30 years old, he was sitting by the banks of the Kaibar River, not too far from Babylon. And there, Ezekiel began having visions of Elohim in the now destroyed temple. I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, and they did not turn as they moved. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Ezekiel's God sits enthroned and is carried around by these strange four creatures. But these creatures face all points on the map. They face north, south, east, and west at once because they have four faces. And they have wheels. These creatures and the God they carry can move. God isn't stuck in just one place, not even his own temple. Ezekiel goes on. Above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He, the Lord, said, Son of man, an idiom meaning human being, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been amongst them. The people had tried to break their covenant with their God, and now they were being punished. But the covenant remains true either way, and so God wants to remind them that there are still prophets amongst them. There's still a way to commune with Elohim. And it wasn't just the prophets who could do this. It was also the myths, the old stories of their Hebrew ancestors. The stories moved with the people, even in exile in Babylon. And so Elohim presents Ezekiel with a scroll, a piece of literature, that will stay with him no matter what. Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, 
eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. And then he said, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. And so I ate it, and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. The myths, the scroll, are now a part of the prophets. The stories live in the people. So even if the temple falls and the cult stops, the myths survive in the Hebrews themselves and are given back to them through the mouths of their prophets. And of course, there's political value in these prophets and their stories. The prophets told of how God himself had granted them their ancient king, David, and his descendants were the rightful rulers of the Hebrews forever, no matter what happened, even in Babylon. The Davidic kings were anointed, meaning that they had had royal oil rubbed on their heads, an ancient sign of kingship. Even without a capital city, a temple, or a land, these anointed kings of David continued on. The Hebrews also compiled and composed other literatures that were neither the five books of instruction, the Torah, nor the words of the prophets, the Nevi'im. These were the creative literatures of the Hebrews, which they collectively called the Ketuvim, the writings. The Ketuvim included the Hebrews' stories, their prayers, and the sayings of their people. The largest of these Ketuvim was a musical compilation. They called these the chants of praise, Telhelim, or as it was called later in Greek, Psalms, the origin of our word songs. Many of these individual songs were attributed to the people's united King David, but it was actually a compilation of many songs from lots of different sources, all of them somehow directly or indirectly lamenting the Babylonian captivity. Here's just one famous example. This one's not attributed to David, but rather to an unknown Hebrew captive who is forced to sing for the amusement of his Babylonian captors. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. That's Jerusalem, remember? There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. The Babylonian captivity was a remarkable period for the production of Hebrew literature, both writing new literatures in many different genres, while simultaneously compiling and editing old literatures. But this literary revival didn't last long. In the year 540, a new king rose to power in Babylon, Cyrus. Cyrus had no particular interest in keeping many of the Hebrews captive. Whatever threat the Hebrews seemed to have posed 47 years earlier was now gone, and so the captives were allowed to return to their home region again in the year 539 BCE. Within a generation, a new second temple was built roughly on the same spot as Solomon's temple. And the cult of the temple returned to play a major role in the life of the Hebrew peoples. But their literary transformation lingered on. A huge amount of their myths, laws, customs, songs, and poetry had now passed into physical writing. And this at once preserved the experiences of their ancestors, but also promoted the centrality of written texts in a way somewhat unique in the ancient world. By the year 200, 
the many literatures of the Hebrews were being spoken of collectively as Tanakh. Tanakh is a Hebrew acronym for the Torah, the five books of instruction, the Nevi'im, the prophetic books, and the Ketuvim, the writings. It was an anthology, a collection of many kinds of writings from many different sources on many topics from many different generations, but they all belonged together somehow. Now, they didn't put this whole Tanakh into a single scroll or book. A handwritten manuscript like that would be so massive it would be outrageously expensive and so heavy that it would be useless anyway. But they still spoke of all of these many literatures as a collection, a canon, a fixed body of writings that together have authority. Even though they weren't literally all in a single volume, the Tanakh together stood for something. It stood for this people, their chosenness, and their covenant with their God. Around the same time as the Tanakh began to get spoken of as the canon of Hebrew literatures, Hebrew itself as a living language started to die out. It was being replaced by more common Middle Eastern languages. Aramaic on the popular level. And on the literary, political, and commercial level, Greek became the norm. And in Greek, the Tanakh was referred to as the collection of biblos, literatures, using the plural ta biblia, the books, what we call today the Hebrew Bible. Now that's a lot of names in Hebrew words. But let's see if you can sort it all out so as to answer these questions. Can you describe the Jerusalem temple? Why was it important? Define Yom Kippur, Elohim, Tanakh, Babylonian captivity, Shabbat, and Pesach. What is Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim? What kinds of materials and themes are found in each?